So two weeks to go for the U.S. presidential elections and the race between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump remains seemingly a dead heat. <clears throat> a string of surveys recently, as of the third week of October, showing that Harris has a narrow, less than a 1% advantage over Trump, even though in the key battleground states, she seems to be a notch behind. Harris has managed to, of course, ever since her candidacy was announced back in July when President Joe Biden pulled out of the Democratic nomination, she managed to uh, sort of build up a lead through much of August and September. But over the last three weeks or so, Donald Trump has managed to narrow the gap quite significantly to the point today where if an election were to be held today, it'll virtually be a dead heat. Less than 1% separates Trump and Harris. Can Trump, who famously outsmarted and outwitted uh, and outwon Hillary Clinton back in 2016, can he do that again? Can he script a come-from-behind victory yet again, this time in 2024? Let's try and find out from the man who is pitched as the Nostradamus of predicting U.S. elections. I call him the Oracle of American elections. Professor Alan Lickman uh, from the American University is now joining us. Thank you very much, Professor, for speaking with us. Good to see you, as always. Um, when we spoke last, I think it was in August, and you had just come out with your announcement uh, with the keys, and you said in 2024, your prediction was that Kamala Harris would win the 2024 election. Are you sticking to your prediction, particularly given how the gap seems to be narrowing, particularly in the last few weeks? Uh, it seems like Kamala Harris is finding it much tougher today than when you made your prediction back in August. My prediction has nothing to do with the polls. That's the mistake a lot of people make. You can take those polls and do with them what the great British philosopher David Hume said, <clears throat> you should do to works of superstition, consign them to the flames. They're all noise because the error margin is vastly greater than the pollsters would tell you. They tell you, you've heard this, it's plus and minus 3%, right? Mm -hmm. That's pure statistical error. That's the error you would get if you had a huge jaw of green and red balls and you pulled out a sample to estimate the percentage of green and red balls in the jar. But human beings are not green and red balls. They don't respond to pollsters. They may lie. Uh, the election is not held today. They're going to change their minds. And the pollsters have no idea who's actually going to vote. They have to guess at the likely voters. That at least doubles the error margin to at least plus and minus 6%, which is a 12-point gap. It has to be 12 points or more. And that additional error is not random. In 2016, the polls underestimated Republican voting strength, which is why, in defiance of the polls, I predicted Trump's win, even got a letter of congratulations from him after that prediction. But based on what we've seen in 2022 to 2024, the polls are now underestimating Democratic voting strength. Look, you know, I know the media has to slavishly follow the polls. You have to tell a story every single day. You got to make believe the election is a horse race with the pollsters keeping score. But my system transcends all that. It's based upon the presumption that elections are driven by the strength and performance of the mm. White House party. That's why I introduced my prediction before the so-called Harris-Trump pivotal debate that the pundits were talking about. Yeah. But t tell me this, uh, Professor, you base your predictions not on any of these polls, but the answers to your 13 true or false questions or keys, as you call them, the 13 keys to the White House. And you've recently even got into a bit of a scruff with some traditional pollsters, the likes of Nate Silver, etc., uh, who you have called a compiler of polls, a clerk. Why would you say that your model is better than that of, you know, so many... Uh, political scientists, data crunchers, the likes of Nate Silver. I and mean, there's millions of dollars backing uh, the polling industry. Simple reason, track record. I've been right for 42 years since I predicted Ronald Reagan's re-election in April 1982, nearly three years ahead of time when 60% of Americans said he was too old to run again and his approval ratings were down in the dumps. I defied all the pollsters, all the pundits in predicting Donald Trump in 2016. Remember what Nate Silver told us, depending on the time of day, 
you checked in with him, he said there was, well, a 70 to 80 percent chance Hillary Clinton would win the election. Then when she lost, he said, see, I told you there was a 20 percent plus chance that she would lose. If you can't be wrong, you also can't be right. My predictions are definitive. I tell you who's going to win or lose. My predictions are totally nonpartisan. I've predicted the two most conservative presidents of our time, mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump and liberals like Barack Obama. Can I be wrong? Of course. I'm a human being. Any human being can be wrong, although no one has a 42-year track record. Maybe you've just outlived everyone else. You know, my predictions are based on also 160 years of historical patterns. Mm -hmm. Retrospectively in development, I've gone all the way back to 1860 when we had no radio, no television, no automobiles, no planes, no poles. Women couldn't vote. African-Americans were enslaved. We were an agricultural society. So the poles have survived enormous changes in our, excuse me, the, the uh, keys, enormous well, changes. Wouldn't you be concerned uh, because you predicted a Harris win and, and, and by consequence of that, wouldn't the, wouldn't the Harris campaign be worried that A, she doesn't seem to be the candidate who has momentum, particularly in these last three weeks leading up to the polls. Uh, she had a much wider gap back in September and in August than she has now. Uh, it's almost like it's a come from behind sort of strategy for, for Donald Trump. Does that not concern? Because in a contest where you're going all in towards November 5th, if the perception is, and she's had a bunch of missteps. I mean, the Fox News interview last week, uh, not going to the Catholic dinner in memory of Al Smith, uh, her going to Michigan, to Detroit, and giving a speech for six and a half minutes. It doesn't seem like, you know, she's, she's, she's making the right steps or the right moves. You know, if Trump wins, and as I said, I can be wrong, but I explain why I don't follow the polls. Journalists like you are going to have to look really hard in the mirror. You're talking about the most minor matters. Oh, you know, I didn't do as well as I could have in this interview. I didn't go to this dinner. Absolutely insignificant. Whereas Donald Trump has made it crystal clear that if he wins this election, he is going to govern as an authoritarian. He is going to go on a revenge campaign against anyone he doesn't like. He is going to put his thumb on all the independent agencies of government. And our democracy may well die because he's being protected by a Supreme Court decision. How is it that you focus on these minor, insignificant things from Harris and don't focus on the fact that our democracy may well die if Trump wins. And he's, he's made that crystal clear time and again, plus his incredible cognitive diminishment. You know, the press was all over Biden for faltering in the debate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How about Donald Trump spending 12 minutes talking about Arnold Palmer in the shower? Can you imagine that? Stopping questioning and spending 39 minutes, you know, trying to sway to the music you know, confusing people's names, getting everything wrong. You know, you guys in the press are my buddies, but boy, oh boy, have you missed the boat big time here. So, but, but tell me this, these are important issues and no one is underplaying or denying the importance of those issues, whether it is Trump's seemingly cognitive decline, whether it is, uh, you know, him putting democracy on the ticket as, as the Democrats are alleging and so on and so forth. But ultimately, most elections, and this is, I think, two out of your 13 keys, are on the state of the economy. Most Americans... It's only two keys, you're yeah, right. Most Americans feel like they are worse off economically today than they were four years ago. Look, based on the economy, Hillary Clinton should have won in a landslide in 2016. The economy was doing incredibly well. Based on the economy, Hubert Humphrey in 1968 should have won in a landslide. It was the best economy we've ever had. That's just two keys out of 13. You can't just isolate two of the keys. If you want to develop your own political system just based on polling on the economy, go right ahead. I get this all the time. But I have never seen a system that's successful actually in doing that. And again, you haven't responded to my critical point, which is you have vastly underplayed 
the danger that Trump poses to our to our future democracy. But explain this to me. Explain this to me Harris. as to why you think that is the number one issue concerning ordinary Americans in this election. If it isn't, the press has tremendous amount to blame. You're going to need to look in the mirror if Trump wins, because you're not going to have a free press anymore. Remember, his model is, is Hungary, where there is no free press and no free opposition. You're going to have to look long and hard in the mirror and explain why you failed to really, in incredibly important ways, point out the danger that Trump poses. You spent way more time, energy, and effort on Biden's faltering debate than on Trump's existential threat to the future okay. of our society. L let me come down to the brass tacks. The show is called sure. Brass Tacks, and that is uh, ultimately the winner of the Electoral College, not the popular vote, the winner of the Electoral College wins the presidency, and that boils down to about half a dozen states. Uh, again, what we are seeing is in the so-called blue wall states, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, which is a must win for Harris, her leads were much more a month ago or two months ago than it is now. I mean, Hillary Clinton lost all of those three states going in with a three and a half, four percent lead on Election Day. So why, why do you believe that Harris will do better than Hillary Clinton eight years ago in those three states? Because she needs those three states to win. She wins those three states. She gets the White House. You're making the same mistake you made in 2016 going with the polls. At that time, going with the polls, the most eminent compiler of polls was not Nate Silver. It was the Princeton University Consortium, you know, one of the world's leading universities, headed by the eminent Professor Sam Wang. And they gave Clinton a 99% chance of winning the election based on the polls. And Wang said, I'm so confident I'll eat a bug on national television if I'm wrong. And indeed, he did that to his credit. So you can keep talking about the polls, but the polls have nothing to do with the keys to the White House. And as I said, the error margin is so great that uh, these very close polls, as in 2016, one way or the other mean nothing. I explained in 2016 they were underestimating Republican voting strength because of the non-statistical unidirectional era. Now they're underestimating Democratic voting strength. So if you want to make predictions and, like and Nate Silver, what, go right what, ahead. But that's what, not, let me finish. That's not what my model does. It transcends all that. Why, why do you say, and explain this to us in layman terms for our viewers watching, why do you say the Democratic voting strength is being underestimated in the polls this election cycle? Because that's exactly what's happened in every election in 2022. You know, they were predicting this great red wave that absolutely fizzled. In the off-year elections of 2023, uh, the Democrats did way better than expected. And look at the marquee special election of 2024, the New York State congressional election for the seat previously held by the disgraced, expelled George Santos, a swing district previously won by a Republican. A poll taken right at the eve of the election had it as a dead heat. Democrat ahead by an insignificant one point. The Democrat won by eight points, outperforming the poll by seven points. And that was not a typical. So you can't presume that the polls aren't biased one way or the other. Why then, uh, Professor, are we seeing, you know, down, down the ticket races for Senate seats or congressional seats? Uh, many of these folks don't want to be seen campaigning with, uh, with Kamala Harris. Do you not think that they do this? I mean, who would not want to be seen as campaigning in a joint rally with a presidential candidate? The reason they're not I'm doing not it, sure Bob, Casey you, in, I'm not sure. Bob Casey in Pennsylvania, for example. I'm not sure which candidates you're talking about, but, you know, again, that's not predictive of anything. You can point to all kinds of individual things 
And that's the fallacy of predicting by punditry without having a track record and a scientific basis. You could say she's way outraised Donald Trump and way outraised Donald Trump in her fundraising in small donations. He has these billionaires like Elon Musk, but he's got no traction among ordinary voters. You can say, sure, that's going to predict a Harris victory. You could pull any individual thing out you want. And that's the fallacy of punditry. And that's why the pundits are so often wrong, not just in 2016. In 2012, after Obama's disastrous first debate against Mitt Romney in October, when the polls turned against him, the pundits were writing him off. I stuck to my prediction of an Obama win. I was right. In 1988, in May, the election year, George H.W. Bush fell 17 points behind his opponent, Mike Dukakis. Pundits and pollsters again wrote him off, saying no one has ever come back from that kind of deficit. I stuck with my prediction that H.W. Bush would win, and I was right. I told you I predicted Ronald Reagan in 1982 when he was down in the dumps in the polls, mm -hmm. and 60% of Americans said he was too old to run again. Okay, so final final part of the interview as we come to the to the conclusion. Sure. I'm going to read out your 13 keys uh, for true or false, and then we're going to see you know if anything has changed between August when you made your first prediction for Kamala Harris. No, no, I made my House. prediction. Let me correct you there. I made my prediction September 5th in the New York Times. I don't know if you've seen the video, but you should check it out. All right. I did not make it in August. So here, here, here are your keys. Key number sure. one, incumbent party mandate. So is that a yes or a no for Harris? No. Uh, number two, nomination contest. There is no serious contest for the incumbent party nomination. Is that's that a, a yes? yes. Or, that's a yes. So that's one key. Uh, incumbency, the incumbent party candidate is the sitting president. That's a no. No. All right. Uh, the third party, there are no significant third party or independent campaigns. We did see RFK Jr., but he's now supporting Trump. You don't think that's going to make a difference? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, he's down around one or two percent. And just because he's supporting Trump is meaningless. And that's not the definition of the key. I've got to say, every single day, I get a host of emails of people saying they know better how to define my keys than I do. <laughs> but my keys, if you want to use my system, you've got to stick to keys that have stood the test of time for 160 years. If you want to talk about some other way of looking at elections, I welcome it. I encourage it. But if you're going to use my system, you got to stick to how I define the so, keys. And by the way, none of these critics ever developed their own. So, so let me let me run through the rest of them. Short term economy, long term economy, both. Yes. For Harris. Yes. Uh, policy change, social unrest and scandal. Yes. All three of them. Yes. Uh, foreign or military failure, foreign or military success? Split, a no and a yes. Uh, and then incumbent charisma and challenger charisma? Incumbent charisma is a no, challenger charisma is a yes. So how many keys are a yes? And you say you have to get more than seven uh, to win? It's or nine you... to four. It's nine to four. So Harris gets nine keys and therefore, as per the Alan Lickman keys to the White House, she wins the White House. Okay. That's my prediction. You know, can I be wrong? <laughs> of course. You know, there can be such cataclysmic and unprecedented changes that can overturn 160 years pattern of history. You know, I'm not psychic Gene Dixon with a crystal ball. I'm not Speaker Mike Johnson okay. who thinks the Almighty speaks to him. The problem is you can't know in advance whether the pattern that's held since the mid 19th century is going to change. We will speak to you hopefully on the 6th of November, the day after the election, and see if the Alan Lickman 13 keys to the White House still hold true and whether your prediction of Kamala Harris winning the White House uh, does indeed come true. Thank you very much in the meanwhile for joining us, Professor. Thank you. Great interview. Take care.